Heavenly Father, tonight we come before you as a congregation, as a people, so grateful for all that you've done already in the service. Your presence is real, tangible for people that have come from afar and even from nearby. We ask tonight, God, that you would release your power upon us and you would give us living understanding. That we, Lord, would receive truth and truth, even revelation, that would bring a revolution in our lives, in our community, in our nation. God, thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Uh, Before I begin to communicate the this message to you, I want to encourage you, if you have not joined in the tremendous joy of prayer and fasting that we're in the midst of, by all means, jump on in, the water's fine. (laughs) Tremendous time of prayer and fasting, the first, uh, well, 21 days starting from January 4th, so today is day 10, and so we will continue on uh, through the 24th. On the 24th, we'll have a miracle service. Somebody said, Pastor, we always have miracle services. I know. I know that's the way it should be, but we're going to have specifically healings, signs, wonders, miracles, and healings on the 24th at night. And uh, I want you to bring in every person you know that needs a touch from God. That'll be the last night of the fast, and some of you are praying that God would break some things off of your life, off of your family, maybe off of your finances, or off of your home, maybe off of your physical body, you're believing for healing. On that night, I have seen more miracles at the conclusion of the fast. You know, Jesus fasted for 40 days, and then he returned in the power of the Spirit. Many people are looking for the miracles to happen dead center of the middle of the fast, when the truth is, most times it happens at the end. Now, it just so happens for me and for many that I know, we're already seeing tremendous breakthrough all over the place. Amen. Amen. Ten days into it, seeing all kinds of breakthrough. We had such a tremendous meeting today in the planning of our new facility. I'm just telling you, it is going to be a most beautiful building that we are building, and, uh, and God's hand is on it, the favor of God. When the builder and the architect, the designers tell you that, you know, that's something. I love how we, all these engineers and people there at the end of that meeting today, I said, well, lay your hands on the plans, everybody. Everybody's like, what's he doing? I was going to come up with you. Hey, hey, let's pray. And everybody's all, they all bow their head. Come on, this is God's project. Just so excited about it. We will break ground in the spring. Say it. We will break ground in the spring. I don't think you meant it half as much as you need to. Say it again. We will break ground in the spring. Amen. I told them I'm believing for March 21st to break ground, and they said, that would take a major miracle. I said, well, if I'm out there with a shovel digging a hole, then we're going to break ground. You know what I'm talking about? All right. It's a prophetic declaration. There's many things that has to happen, many things that have to, many uh, cogs in the wheel that have to come together. But if you pray, I want you every time you drive past that property, how many of you know where it is? Raise your hand. Well, that's not nearly enough. Either that or you're not going to raise your hand. No matter what I say, it's, it's across from Walmart, up from Sears. If you pass a brand new Dodge dealership, it's a, you look and you'll see this tattered old blue barn. That's our prayer barn. We meet in there every day. In fact, this coming Friday, 24 hours of prayer starting at 6 in the morning goes all the way through the night. We'd encourage you to be there. We'll have staff there and leaders there. and That's where our, our church will be. You say, where is that? You know where the new Welcome to Wasilla sign is? Well, our church will sit right on top of that. Just saying. Hashtag awesome. Oh, the prayer room. Oh, I, I, I could go on and on. The prayer room so so tremendous. And the youth facilities. Where are the youth? Where, yeah, then the youth facilities are just off the hizzy. The children's facilities, amazing. The bathrooms. Hey! Praise God. Just broke my microphone. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Let's get into this text. The name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Say that. The name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We're identified by names. 
Uh, my name is, my given name, they were, my, my mother was going to call me David, but my father said no. So they said, well, then it's, it's Daniel then. So my name, they gave it to me when I was born, is Daniel. My middle name is Andrew, and my last name is Bracken. Daniel Andrew Bracken. What's your name? Right? You know what your name is, right? That's how you're identified. Yo, Johnny! What? Okay, we, we call each other by names. And it's a fascinating text, and, and really, I remember when I first read this uh, way back a million years ago, and I thought, the name, what is this deal with the name of Jesus? The name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Wow. So it's fascinating to me that many people have nicknames. How many of you have a nickname? Raise your hand. You do? That's a lot. Like if you're really tall, they call you Stretch. I know one guy, they called him Stinky. You know, how'd you get your nickname? Some of, the, some of you have names on you that need to be broken off of you. Because there's power in a name. There is power, power, wonder, work, and power in a name. It's in the blood, yeah, but it's in power in, in names. That's why it's so important that you speak life over your kids, over your spouse, over your church, over community. It's so important to, to speak life. There's power in it. And so here this miracle takes place of this man who's brought daily, carried daily. And the miracle takes place in Jesus' name. How are, how are names given? Uh, how, did, how did names in ancient times come about? And l look at your notes with me. Well, many times it come through a description of a person. So how many of you ever heard of the name of Esau? Do you know what it means? It means hairy. Hairy. So Esau, I don't know if you ever seen a really hairy child. Hairy baby. I remember, I remember a long time ago. Listen, if I don't finish my notes, you'll just forgive me. All right? They're just sort of a guideline tonight. I remember we were in uh, some supermarket. And I saw this newborn child. I mean, they were carrying him like a newborn. Except the hair was past his shoulders. Long hair past his shoulders. I just kept staring like, how could that be a baby? How could that be this beautiful hair that was past his shoulders? So I'm, we're in line. Do you remember? And I said, I'm just going to go look. She's like, don't do it. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm going to go. So I, I, I had to see the child. You know, so I look around, and I go, oh, what a beautiful baby. And I look up, I'm like, oh, newborn with hair this long. It was like a phenomenon. Esau means hairy. How many of you know when he was born, he was probably? Yeah, yeah. Names came about through physical description. His name, his name another name for Esau or is Edom also. You know what Edom means? Red. Edom means red. So Esau is probably redhead and hairy. Names were given in ancient times through prophetic word. And uh, many of you know the story about um, the ark and how the ark is captured in, uh, in, in the book of Samuel. And when the ark is captured, news comes back to Eli, the high priest, who wouldn't discipline his children. And uh, his sons are dead, and the ark is captured. And so the, the, the herald brings news to Eli. Eli falls over backwards and breaks his neck. It says he breaks his neck, for he was a heavy man. Hey Amen. I'm trying not to fall over. <laughs> he breaks his neck. And one of the, well, his grandson was born, and they named him Ichabod. Ichabod means the glories departed. He got the name through the horrible event that took place in Israel. And they named him Ichabod. He should not ever name your child Ichabod. Wow. 
So it can come through prophetic word. can come through circumstances. Uh, that's really more of a circumstance. This prophetic word, let me give you an illustration for a prophetic word and giving of a name. Do you remember Zechariah? Zechariah, an angel appears to Zechariah and says, the prayer that you used to pray has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, is going to have a child. And you're going to name him John. That's a prophetic word. And, and basically, when the baby was born, they named him John. But they were surprised that they named him John because names can come through, which is D, through relationships. In other words, they didn't make up my last name. My last name's Bracken, B-R-A-C-K-E-N. It's Irish. They didn't make that up. That comes out of a long line of Brackens on my father's side. Took my father's last name, right? Because that's what we do in our culture. Names. So when they say, well, nobody in your family, when they name John the Baptist, nobody in your family has that name. Why would you name him John? Nobody in your family has that name. So you can see that uh, names are coming, come from family and through relationships. I'm going to be named after somebody in your family. Very good. To get a new name meant that you got to change a character in the Bible. Names are very significant. In fact, when you read through Old Testament, uh, remember, remember Jesus? He says, I'll call you, you know, Peter, Cephas. For on this rock, Peter the rock, he changes his name. He's no longer Simon. He's now, he's now Peter. P Jesus changed his name after he had that revelation that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And so there's new names that are given. He who overcomes, book of Revelation talks about, he who overcomes will be given a, a new name. When I got saved, I was, I was Dan. I was Danny when I was a little boy. And then as I grew up, they called me Dan. And uh, that didn't go so well for a little while until I got gloriously saved. And when I got saved, I just said, man, I'm not, I'm not that. I'm taking my full name. That's why, can I call you Dan? No, <laughs> I'm not Dan. My name's Daniel. I take my whole name. God is my judge. You know, that's pretty heavy, like, you know. So when I got saved and I became a new creation in Christ, for me, I, I, I really wanted to be called something. I didn't want to be called what they called the old guy. And so I said, man, I, I'm taking my full name, Daniel. So somebody said, can I call you Dan? And so the answer is no. Can we call you Pastor Dan? No, you can't. <laughs> it's not my name. My name's Daniel. But who you, who you were, in essence, was summarized by your name. In fact, I think many of you will find that you have a name that's actually prophetic. That you'll find that in your name. Now, if you, if you don't have a name that, that has such a good meaning, well, don't worry about it. And the good news is, if you don't like your name, you can change it. Yeah. So, who you were, in essence, was summarized by your name. Names have a sphere of influence. Right? Names have a sphere of influence. So I, I carry a, a weight of authority here. I'm the lead person, lead leader here, the senior pastor over KC Alaska. So I carry authority here, right? Okay. My name doesn't carry authority necessarily in another church. It carries authority in the spirit, right? Not my name, but I carry authority in the spirit, but my, my name... Well, it's interesting, actually, that the, the, the seven sons of Sceva, they say, Jesus we know, Paul we heard about. That means Paul's name is known in hell. Is your name known in hell? Just checking. When you wake up, demons should run. Dr. Morocco has much greater authority and sphere of influence than I do. He's, he's our senior pastor. He's... He's over KC Worldwide. So if Dr. Morocco says we're doing this, let's guess what we're doing. Glory to God, we're doing this, whatever that is, with joy and victory in Jesus' name. Amen? <laughs> President Barack Obama, his sphere of influence with his phone and his pen changes all kinds of laws. Some of you missed that altogether. I have a phone and a pen with his executive orders. Why? He has authority. We voted him in. Well, America voted him in, apparently. 
I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so sick of, I'm so, we need, we need a turnaround in our nation. I'm leaking. They tell you in, they tell you in, in school and discipleship and, 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 uh, and my own mentoring from Dr. Morocco, you never want to get political. And the reason is, you know why? You want to be careful not to get political because what you do is you polarize people. What do you mean by that? It means if I take a particular strong stance, and frankly, I've been taking one lately, <laughs> then, then what you do is you cut off anybody that might be uh, not thinking that way, and you limit your ability to be able to teach and minister to them. And I never want to do that, but enough's enough for God's sake. Okay, praise God. I will try to... No, I'm not going to try to be more politically correct. I'm sorry. I, it's just, that's how I'm wired up right now. I'm just, we got to have a breakthrough. America needs a turnaround. And if you don't agree, then you can answer an altar call at the end, and I'll pray for you. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> you should hear sometimes some of the stuff that goes through my head. Pastor Alex, would you just pray for me real quick? Jesus, help me. We could pretend I'm the evangelist tonight instead of the pastor. So names have a sphere of influence. Names have a sphere of influence. So let's look at the text. So Peter and John at the hour of prayer are passing this dude, this crippled man, 40 years crippled. He's begging for alms, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, and we've said it so many times before, I think the church has forgotten what we really have. You know, it's not money or silver and gold or diamonds and pearls. Thank you for worship. Really enjoyed it. That's not going to bring the breakthrough. What brings the breakthrough is the power of the name of Jesus. What brings the breakthrough is, is God. How many of you know that, that man really didn't need silver and gold? Oh, I don't mean he could have put some hummus on his plate and get some chips. That would have been great. Get some food that night. That would have helped him satisfy his is hunger, but really he was crippled. I mean, the greatest miracle it would be that he would get totally healed. Silver and gold have I none. And I don't know if they left their, they left their wallets at home, their money bags, their purses at home. I don't know what the deal is. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And then they boldly take him by the hand and they lift him up. And immediately this miracle is released. A miracle takes place in the name of Jesus. In whose name? In the name of Jesus. Right, not, not, in, not in Peter's name, not in John's name. In the name of Jesus. So what does that mean? What actually does that mean? The name of Jesus. Faith in his name has produced this miracle. You look at verse uh, 16 further on in the text. And it says, in his name, through faith in his name. See, they get in trouble the religious police bust him, and, and they get in trouble. Oh, no, this is during the preaching, pardon me. So everybody sees him, and Peter, a lame man, verse 11, who was healed. Peter, John, and all the people ran together. And then the porch, which is called Solomon's, is greatly amazed because they all knew the dude. They walked past him their whole lives. Well, you know, unless they were older than 40, right? So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people and he begins to preach. And in his preaching, in verse 16, he says, In and his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. They all knew him. Is what is called a notable miracle. Wow. Faith in his name. Confident assurance. Confidence, confident assurance in his name and all that that means. His influence, his power, his authority, his integrity, his character. Listen, if I got, if I got a phone call and it's Dr. Morocco's, uh, the executive secretary, and she says to me, Pastor Bracken, I said, yes, Dr. Morocco told me to call you and told me to such and such and so and so. And he needs you to do it right now. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Boom. Over. She's carrying the word from a man who has authority over our whole network, right? Who I'm submitted to gladly, gladly. Do you get it? 
So what they are coming in the name, not in the name of Dr. Morocco, they're coming in the name of the King of Kings. They're coming in the name of the Lord of Lords, knowing his will, knowing his power, knowing his authority in the name of Jesus. Is anybody getting this so far? Come on, we're not praying in Bubba's name. Not, not praying in Jethro's name. In Jethro's name. Ain't nothing going to happen. Name of Jesus. So powerful that religious leaders forbid Peter and John. It's like they have an understanding about the authority of a name more than we do. They, they, they say, you will not preach in his name again. You will not preach in this name again. You will not speak in this name again. You'll not walk in this authority. You'll not use the power and of his name. You'll not do that anymore. They, they rebuke them. And they say, what do they say? The same thing that we would say to our government. There I go again. If they say, you can't read your Bible or preach the name of Jesus. And then at that, we say, far be it for you. I mean, you, you judge whether it's right to obey you rather than God, buddy. I'll be obeying God. I'm going to carry my Bible, preach, whatever. You know, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm not going to shrink back. Come on, somebody say amen. The name of Jesus is so powerful, they're forbidden. So how did they know to use his name? Ask yourself this question. How did the disciples know to use his name? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. How did they know to use it? Well, they experienced miracle power of Jesus. They've seen, they've seen his authority. They've seen his power. Demons cried out and said, What have you to do with us, Jesus, Son of God? Demons, the demon, demoniac of Gadara, he crosses over and the demoniac says, you know, don't we know who you are? You're the son of God. Don't torment us before our time. They, they commanded them with the word to go out of the man. Demons flee in Jesus name. When he sent out the seven, when he sent out the 12, he said, go in my name, heal people in my name, healing in my name, bring peace in my name. And they come back, the same with the 70, the 72, they go out the same thing. We saw demons subject to us in your name. My daughter got her driver's license today. Yeah. You should have seen me trying to take the, the, the token, you know, parental picture of the kid with the new driver's license. Not like that, Dad. I thought you were supposed to do this. No selfie. No, turn. Anyway, we got it, right? And uh, I'm so proud of her. But, you know, it's an interesting thing. She couldn't have got her driver's license. I happened to be standing there with my driver's license, signing my signature, giving my consent. You know why? Because i got authority over her. Where is she? Amen. She understands that. Praise God. I'm her parent. That's right. I have authority over my house. Amen. Yeah. Someone's like, you know that's right. In the same way, where the king is, so is his kingdom. And if he lives on the inside of you, you can go and actually rep represent, represent. Think about that. I'm representing Jesus. Oh, I got a story to tell you. I'm representing Jesus. How many of you like boiled peanuts? Very f select few are boiled peanut eaters. Oh, yeah, Hank. I know you eat boiled peanuts. <laughs> it's kind of a southern, isn't it a southern thing? Well, boiled peanuts are big in the Hawaiian Islands, too. I, they just love boiled peanuts. We lived there for 14 years before coming here almost a decade ago. And uh, I was pastoring on Kauai, and... Um, one of the brothers in the church said, hey, pastor, would you come and cast the devil out of my cousin? I said, yeah, let's do it. He said, I said, tell me what's going on. Well, she lives in the, you know, she's up here and she is demonized. I mean, like crazy. She's, I mean, there's been other pastors that have come and she beats them up. The last guy went to the hospital. I just thought, whoa, yeah, come on, bring it. Thank you, Jesus. I said, you know what, let's just, let's fast and pray for three days. I said that. Let's fast and, come on. I might have fallen off a turn of truck, but it wasn't yesterday. Someone said, we're going to fast and pray, and 
Because, you know, sometimes this kind does not come out except by prayer and fasting. So we fast and pray for three days. Robert Orsatelli. You remember Robert Orsatelli, don't you? Robert Orsatelli. So we get in the car and we drive up to this place and we get to the house. And I thought it's going to be like, you know, hi, my name is Pastor Daniel and I'm from King's Chapel. We just want to come in and cast the devil out of you, you know. I, I thought it was going to be something kind of like that. So we knock, I knock on the door, and, and he sort of steps back just a little bit. I'm like, and he's all. So I'm like, maybe I should have taken a hint. So we're waiting, and it's kind of like I can feel the power of the Holy Spirit just coming on me more and more and more and more. I'm kind of like, oh. Not really, but in the spirit, you know what I mean? And so, so she opens the door. I mean, the door opens like, violently opens. And here's this woman wearing, I, I really don't know what she was wearing. It was scary. And, and her mouth was filled with boiled peanuts. With the shells on. I'm talking chipmunk style. Peanuts. And she's cursing. She opens the door and she's like, what the and she's just cursing at me, spitting peanut shells all over me and, and Robert. And when that happened, I just, I mean, it wasn't even like, oh, nice to meet you or anything like that. It was on. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? It was on. We realized, oh, devil. And she's like, I said, in the name of Jesus. And we moved forward. And she backed up. She backed into her house. And we moved in. And I began to declare the, the, the authority of the name of I began to declare it. I began to proclaim. In fact, I think I preached the gospel, which is something I do when I'm scared. <laughs> oh, you, you, might, you, might, you might try it. Because I, I, I just, you know, I know that the devil knows that Jesus died on a cross and he rose again from the grave. I know that I've got authority. You know, it's kind of convincing myself sometimes. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Just trying to get, a, get an anointing, an empowerment. And she is still cursing. Now she's probably 15 feet away from me, 10 feet away, 15 feet away in the kitchen. And she grabs a, uh, a, a tiki doll that's made out of stone. And not a doll, but a tiki. How many of you know what a tiki is? It's like a, it's a little idol. It was about this big. and I, it, it was made out of, I don't know what it was made out of. Lava rock or something, right? And she just runs at me, and as she's coming, she's like slow motion, <laughs> peanut shells, <laughs> spit and stuff, and she's got this thing, <laughs> and she's going to smash me in the face with it. And this has happened to me a number of times. It's just kind of like, maybe more often than I'd care to admit. I just sort of go dumb. And I'm looking slow motion at this tiki about to smash my face. And just before she hits me, God bless Pastor Rob, Robert Orsatelli. God bless Robert Orsatelli. Reaches in and stops her. I was like, shit, Jesus, that's right. <laughs> and uh, she kept her devils and we weren't able to get her free. It's a true story. I'd love to tell you, oh, she shirked and jerked and got filled with the Holy Ghost. And here she is walking in. No, she's not here. And that didn't happen. But there's authority in Jesus' name. Hey, I didn't get my face smashed. Come on, somebody say hallelujah. Some other guys went home naked and bleeding. I left walking and intact. Hey! It's not exactly the most victorious story. Wow, somebody say, in the name of Jesus. Say, one, two, three, in the... John 14, 12. Jesus had given them his name to expand his kingdom. John 14, 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. 
that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. The thing is, you have to understand what the name is. In other words, if you're asking for some, some corrupt, evil thing that's going to hurt you and others, how many of you know he's not going to bless that? Because that's not a part of his name. The will of God is in the name of God. D did, you, did you follow me? So if you abide in me, I'll abide in you. Right? The abiding part... The abiding is, is remaining in his word, his word remaining in you, and it's this relationship that you have. So you, when you have that relationship, you have tremendous authority as long as you're praying according to his name, and you can't pray evil in his name because it's not a part of it. Some of you might get that on the way home. You can't, you can't pray for something. I mean, you could pray for something evil in his name. It's just if it happens, it was the devil. It's not God. Kill him, God! Kill him, Jesus! In Jesus' name! Kill him! No. You know not what spirit you're of. Do you remember the disciples walking with Jesus and, and they said, Hey, Lord, look, should we call fire down on those guys? Now, I, I love the faith. They actually believed that they could call fire down. You got to love the ambition of the disciples. Lord, should we smoke them right now? We just smoke them. Should we smoke them? The Lord's like, dudes, you know not what spirit you're of. But you, you, like, you see the faith? I like that. Understanding the name continued on in the church age. That's the age that we're in now. And uh, Philippians 2, 9, Therefore God ha also has highly exalted him and given him the name. The what? The name, which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth. Wow. Amazing. Come on, someone say the name of Jesus. We're called to live in the power of his name. Believing on him brings transformation. Come on. John 1 and 12. To as many as believed on him, he gave them the right to become children of God. Right is the word authority. He said, well, God loves everybody. Yeah, he does. We're all God's children. No, we're not. See, the only way you become his child is not because you're breathing, but because you believed on his name. What does that mean? You believed on the fact that he took your sin, that he was the one, the Messiah, the, the anointed one, the Christ prophesied throughout, even from Genesis and all the way through the one prophets had talked about and the types and shadows throughout all of Scripture. I mean, you couldn't put it together if you were a man. Man wrote the Bible. Oh, you're just an ignoramus. You haven't heard that word in a while, have you? Man wrote the Bible. Yeah, man wrote it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't uh, the, the God, it's God breathed. And I said it before, you won't find a contradiction in it. And if you do, it's only because you have not been discipled and trained in the word to understand actually what it's really saying according to the context of, in which it is written. But when you believe on him, his name, Represents his character. His name represents his authority. His name represents all that he is. All that he is. His name represents the power of heaven. See, we don't understand this, really. But we need to go to another level of understanding. Somebody said, well, you have to pray in the name of Yeshua. Stop. Stop. You can pray in the name of Yeshua, Yeshua, Jesus, same thing. Yeshua is Hebrew. Joshua will save his people from their sins. That's what that means. How many know what Jesus did? He saved his people from their sins. So it's not some magic. It's the magic tone on which you say it. It's the sound of the syllables that just stop. Yeah, stop. That's like, that's like what is that? That's some hocus pocus Christian thing. 
I think you can cast out devils in the name of Yeshua, in the name of Jesus, because they're the same thing. But do you have to say Yeshua? No, you don't. If you're Jewish, say Yeshua. Yeshua. Let's try it. It's fun. Ready? Go. Yeshua. It is, I, I do have to say that Hebrew is interesting in that it is the language that God gave his, his people. I mean, it's Hebrew. So there is significance to it, and it's really actually miraculous uh, in many ways, uh, more than I am educated to tell you about. But the name of Jesus carries, it, 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 the name of Jesus, the name of Yeshua, is, it represents his character, it represents it all that he is. Praying in his name brings results. I have found that. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? Praying in his name brings results. Praying in his name brings results. Hebrews 4, 16. Seeing then we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. That'll encourage you. I mean, no matter what you're going through today, no matter what your trial, no matter what your difficulty, Jesus was tempted. He even, he even was tempted unto death. Really, I mean, like suicide. You look at the Garden of Eden, you look at that whole, that whole he, he was resisting the point of death, shedding, sweating drops of blood. And it says, therefore... Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. He's been through all the temptation. All you need to do is come to him and he'll give you what? He'll give you mercy. He'll give you grace. He'll, he'll find help in time of need. You know what, really, that, that scripture is if you don't come before his throne, then you don't get any help. Now I'm stretching it a little bit. But you get help when you come to the throne. And furthermore, you get more help if you come to the throne than if you don't. Although, thank God for his sovereignty. Can somebody say amen? I wasn't coming to any throne and he intervened. You know why? Because my mama was going to his throne praying for me. And then I just think that, you know, the Lord loved me. Maybe my mama wasn't at the throne, you know, interceding and praying for me. But God came through. Is this helping anybody? Miracles are released in his name. Wow. Pastor Alex, would you come, please? Miracles are released in his name. Now, the thing is, is uh, there's a warning also in that those who speak in his name must have a relationship with him. So where do you get that? In Matthew, put this up on the screen if you can. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does, I was almost done. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven, I appreciate you guys. Go for it. Verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out devils in your name? Done many wonders in your name? Wow. Verse 23. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Hold the phone. Do you mean to tell me that you can prophesy, you can cast out devils, and you can do miracle signs and wonders in his name? And actually, when you get to heaven, he'd say, who are you? See, because there's power in his name. But if you don't have relationship with him you got to have a relationship with him. If you don't have a relationship with God and you use his name while it might have power, I, I, that ought to terrify some of you right there. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. It's a warning. should be a warning for everyone here. 
You got to have a relationship. They don't use his name as a rabbit foot. Rabbit foots were big when I was a kid. Anybody, you know what I'm talking about? You're like, what you got there? Get a rabbit foot. And, and it came with that little, that little cute little chain thing. And, and, uh, and, and some of my neighbors would hook it up to their belt loop. You know, and they'd just be like, what you got there? This is my lucky rabbit foot. You want to touch it? I'm like, no. <laughs> Truth is, I had my own lucky rabbit foot. I've seen people, I've seen people, that, listen, I, I love the cross. I love them. They're in every doorway. Windows in the back are all crosses. I see the cross everywhere. I've had a cross up at the front at times. We have one on the front of the building. It's my favorite symbol. When I was in construction, I marked all of my equipment, every single thing with a cross. I had a cross, had a little heart around it. It's kind of, people look at me like, well, that's kind of sissified. I'm like, yeah, I'm born again, baby. Praise the Lord. And that's obviously my tool, you know? And so I would write that and put it on all of my stuff. I, I remember we branded a cross into my salmon killing, my salmon club. I'm into the cross. But there are people that have crosses around their neck, and it's like, it's like a rabbit foot. Yeah, well, if I just have this. Now, listen, I, I've, I've held on to things, and, you know, I've, I've, I've done things in faith, and I don't think there's anything wrong with it. In other words, when you, you get really troubled or difficulty, maybe, maybe grab your cross. I mean, I'm not wearing one currently, but grab your cross around your neck and you begin to pray and it's sincere and beautiful and wonderful. But listen, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you grab your cross all you want to. Might as well get a string of garlic too. You're still going to get bit. Yeah, you get some holy water and garlic and the cross and you're going to have two big stinking fang marks right here in the spirit. The devil be sucking the blood right out of you. Yeah. Do people still really know those vampire books? That's stupid. We're almost done. I think I've shared this before, but do you know, do you know where that, that came from? The, you know, holding the cross up? And, and this one, you know where this came from? Any, any, any recovering Catholics in here? I'm, I'm, I'm teasing you. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Then again, maybe you, know, maybe you need healing, but I mean, I mean, you know what this is. You ever seen that? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I'm out Irish on my father's side. We went to Catholic Church, and you know, they taught us how to do all that. You know, hey, hey, cross yourself. And genuflect, that was the other thing. How many of you know what genuflecting is? You guys don't know what genuflecting is? Raise your hand if you know what the genuflect is. All right, God bless you. What's up? All you midnight masters. Come on, Jesus. This, this, was, this happened from a priest who was casting out a devil. And the Lord spoke to him and said, make the sign of the cross over you. I'm going to protect you with my blood. You can read this history. And so he, he did that. And, and, the, and he cast the devil out in the name of Jesus. And he, he felt protected, released faith for him. It was, it was a method that God gave him. How many of you know God can do stuff like that? Yeah, but then they made it like into doctrine. Where it means nothing for somebody who's not even saved. And it might mean something for somebody who is. The warning is this. Have a relationship with Jesus. Don't, don't use a rack or rabbit foot. Don't grab the cross around your neck. If you don't have any relationship with him, you can genuflect and do the sign of the cross over you as much as you can say, Father, Son, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Father, Son. I'm going to help you. I remember going to confession. Somebody better come up here and close. Jesus, help me out. I remember going to confession. I'm almost done. Almost done. 
It's my last story. Maybe. I remember going to confession, and uh, I sat there before the priest, and my brother and I had done some bad things. And, uh, and so my father made us go to confession. I don't think I ever went to confession before that or after, after that. I never went, that's for sure. I remember sitting down, and the window opens. And, um, and my dad's teaching me what to say before I go in. He said, you go in there, and you sit down, and the thing's going to open. And you say, bless me, Father, for I've sinned. What do I say? Bless me, Father, for I've sinned. And so I go in, and I'm like, um, bless me, I've sinned, Father. Right? So, door. Guy says, what did you do? And, uh, and so I tell him what we did. And he, and he says, uh, okay, go ten Hail Marys. Three Our Fathers make good act of contrition. I'm like, okay. I knew what the Our Father was, but I had no idea what the Hail Mary is. You know, I wasn't such a good Catholic. So I went down, I remember, sat down. It's Our Fathers four times. I can do the Our Father. I did it four times. Did it four times. Boom, four times. I like the Hail Mary. I'm like, I knew the first part. It was Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord be with thee, something. And so I said, you know, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord be with thee. Times ten. Thanks. <laughs> We're not giving any hail to Mary. We give all hails and hallelujahs and hallowed be his name to the King of Kings. You don't worship, you don't worship Mary, but everybody say relationship. And the sons of Sceva. The sons of Sceva, same thing, right? They, Paul I know. Jesus I know. Dude, who are you? Bah! And they jump on him, just beat the fool out of him. And they run away naked and bleeding. You know, in our culture, when someone does something great for, for God, we have a tendency to elevate them and think that they're, you know, the bomb. That's wonderful, but... Jesus views things differently. Oh. It's awesome, the crusades, the miracles, and the power of God. And Jesus views things differently, whether you're doing, doing things for him or whether he knows you. Does he know you? Do you know him? I think I'm beginning to know him. I want to go deeper in God. How arrogant would it be to say, I know him, I know him, I know him. He's so multifaceted. I mean, whatever aspects, praise God, that we do know of, there's so much more. There are people who use the power of Jesus' name and use his name to, to see people healed, to see people set free, but have no obedient relationship with them at all. They have a secret life. Do you have a secret life? Do you? Do, do you have a secret life? I mean, you, what do you do and nobody will know? No one will know. No one will find out. No one. Do you have a secret life? cast out devils in his name, you can prophesy in his name, and yet you can hear, move along, I never knew you, go on, I don't think he's like that, but it's, he has to bring, um, there is a place called judgment day, listen, there are people here tonight, and you are half in the bag, man, you got, you got one foot in the kingdom, you got one foot in the world, you got so many games and drama, I'm not looking at anybody, you got so many games and drama, so much manipulation and power and control and fear and bitterness, I mean, you're just like working it, and, and, and I'm gonna tell you, it's gonna come back and bite you, that's no way to live, you gotta get healed, you gotta get free, you gotta expose stuff, don't, don't, don't be like that, there's really is, there really is a life of joy and peace and hope 
There really is a life where you don't have to be tormented, so worried about what people think. You don't have to be addicted. You don't have to be afflicted. You don't have to be bound. You can be free. And then that freedom comes out of a relationship with Jesus. It doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you go to church every day of your life. It comes out of an intimacy and a walk and an acknowledgement of who He is and a receiving of His free gift that makes you a son, that makes you a daughter, that makes you a child, gives you the right. Come on, someone say, in the name of Jesus. It's the name of Jesus, the power of His name that sets you free. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up.